If it's Wednesday, April showers bring a muddy 2024 forecast as both Biden and Trump pad their leads in the presidential primaries while running neck and neck in the latest battleground state polls. Plus, President Biden says he's outraged and heartbroken after an Israeli airstrike killed seven World Central kitchen workers in Gaza, as Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu faces mounting pressure from all sides to do more to protect civilians and lower rising regional tensions. And we're following the devastating fallout in Taiwan, where at least nine people are dead and nearly 1,000 more are injured from a major 7.4 magnitude earthquake, the strongest to hit the island in a quarter century. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Garrett Hake in Washington. Both parties' presumptive nominees added to their delegate totals after primary victories in four states last night. There's no drama anymore in these primaries. But when it comes to the November general election, well, that sure looks like it's going to be a nail-biter. Pretty much every national and battleground poll these days has the race between President Biden and former President Trump within the margin of error. We got another one of those today. A new Wall Street Journal poll shows President Biden slightly trailing his Republican opponent in six out of seven key battleground states. Every state is within the margin of error. Mind you now, it's only April. Now, as our own Chuck Todd points out, many key swing voters this election are not in any rush to make up their minds especially when it comes to these two historically unpopular candidates. What motivates these swing voters could be totally outside of the current or former president's control, which brings us to the issues, because that seems to be where both campaigns actually see some certainty. They know what fires up their base voters. For the Biden campaign, it's abortion, as it looks to capitalize on that ruling this week that will put the issue on the ballot in Florida, releasing this ad blaming the former president for the state of reproductive rights in the country. Because for 54 years, they were trying to get Roe v. Wade terminated, and I did it, and I'm proud to have done it. Donald Trump ran to overturn Roe v. Wade. Now, in 2024, he's running to pass a national ban on a woman's right to choose. I'm running to make Roe v. Wade the law of the land again. And meanwhile, Mr. Trump engaged in some downright raw red meat rhetoric on the issue of the border yesterday, attacking Mr. Biden while speaking to his supporters in battleground Wisconsin. I'm here tonight to declare that Joe Biden's border bloodbath. Remember, they used the name bloodbath. I was talking about something entirely different, but this is a border bloodbath. Ends the day I take the oath of office. With your vote, I will seal the border. I will stop the invasion. I will end the carnage, bloodshed, and killing. The former president also used his rally to again falsely claim that he won Wisconsin back in 2020, which leads us to an enormous wild card heading into November right now, and those are the very rules of this democracy. Today, the former president joined a push by Nebraska's Republican governor to have the state's legislature change the way Nebraska doles out its electoral votes in a way that could almost certainly benefit the former president. To be clear, the effort faces major hurdles due to opposition from state house Democrats and independents and just due to the time left in the legislative session in Nebraska. But it's yet another example of Donald Trump exerting his considerable influence over his party at the national and the local level, which has grown more receptive, not less, to his conspiracy theories about the last election and the administration of the next one. And joining me now to break this all down is NBC News chief political analyst Chuck Todd. Chuck, I want to put up something you wrote in your column, this idea that all of this is a warning not to overreact to any poll trend you see developing between now and October. You talk about voters who are the most fickle about the current political situation. The more fickle they are, the higher the variance in both the likelihood to vote and where this vote goes. You cannot tell us to ignore the polls until October. Well, but I, you don't have to. <laughs> and we won't. There'll yeah. be, we're going to get these releases. But the, the point is, the movement, to me, doesn't matter until mm -hmm. these last voters come, right? Where are they going to go? They're the deciders. Yeah. And that my point is, the voters were trying to figure out the unenthusiastic partisans, right, your base turnout, and these double haters. Yeah. They're not going to decide now. Now, they may, asked by a pollster, say, I'm for Kennedy now. I'm for this. Like, I think you will see, my point is, it's going to be volatility that really, yeah, they're still undecided come October, which is why ultimately it's that movement there. And I will point out one thing about the polls that I think is something to keep in mind. 
I think this is, it's possible we look back, this is peak Trump. Because he's, he just won. Mm -hmm. and, and he hasn't been put through the billion dollar ringer that he's about to go Correct. Through. Meanwhile, Biden, he has more room to grow. Now, maybe he never grows, mm -hmm. okay? I mean, I still have room to grow, and I've yet to, I never got to six well, feet. So, I mean, you know, but in theory, there are more potential voters for him to get. So, for Trump, it feels like he's kind of topped out. The thing that's so counterintuitive about all this to me is you've got mm -hmm. an election in which average voters, even low ID voters, right. know more about these two candidates than like any other right, two sure. candidates in history, and yet right. there's still so much uncertainty. I think that's a hard circle to square. Well, if you don't, well, I think it all depends on what your expectation of politics is. And I think that this is something that... Not to that, go too meta. No, I, I, I you know, and I, I wrote about this a couple weeks ago because I do think that there are some people that go into the ballot box, what does it mean for me? Mm -hmm. And then there's some people that go in the ballot boxes, what's best for the, what's best for what I think is best for the country? And you and I don't know which voter is doing that. Yeah. Their vote counts the same. And I think this group of voters, the reason why they're undecided is because I think they... They're, they're mostly, I think they're thinking, well, I don't know which way is the right way. Right. Because I look and I'm like, you know, it could be they're exhausted from the divide. I, I will say this. The other warning I was putting out there is don't assume that the, just because the last two elections basically were identical results, except yeah. with literally a flip, that we're going to have three straight. It's, it's like vetting on black on the roulette table, three yeah. straight. You think, well, it's going to keep going. Sure. But there's equal odds that there's not. And in fact, there's actually greater odds that it won't. And in, if you look at our own history, there's greater odds that we're more likely to see a more decisive move either direction. I think if Trump wins, he wins it all. Yeah. You know, a, yeah. a governing thing. And I think the likelihood that Biden gets everything is higher than we than we fully realize. Um, what I liked about your framing is it helps me understand why we've seen Donald Trump run the race he has been, which has been the no outreach <laughs> whatsoever to the Nikki Haley voters. There's no right. pivot. There's no move to the center. It's to squash those unenthusiastic partisans on the Democratic side. Like, you're right. You do want to mm -hmm. stay home because Joe Biden does suck, right? That is like the whole basis of the Trump campaign right now. I think it is. I think negative, ma making people feel unnerved about their guy, 100%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do think that's Trump's strategy, if there is one. You know what I mean? That's certainly been right, his right. strategy over the years in mm -hmm. order to, how does he become popular, make other people unpopular? Right. It's a frame that makes Correct. sense here. While I have you as our resident Florida man, I yes, want to sir. ask you about the Florida Supreme Court part of this. There was so much, you know, sunshine, if you will, from mm -hmm. Democrats yesterday, even to just call Florida winnable. How realistic does that seem to you on the presidential level or perhaps on the down ballot level, having abortion, Democrats' favorite issue at the yeah. center of this campaign? Look, Let's, the big favor that abortion rights advocates were given was green lighting the six week ban, mm -hmm. right? Because now you have a stark choice. It's one or the other. That's right. You either are a state that restricts abortions completely or you're a state that's going to allow it, pure and simple. Um, but what I, I think we underestimate the intelligence of the voter. Meaning, the voter, there are plenty of voters who understand they vote on this and then they can vote any other way they want. That's right. Ever, elsewhere. Now, do you get more youth turnout? That's a big deal, okay? If you get more youth turnout, and that is the key, that's what we saw in Kansas, mm -hmm. right? If suddenly voters under 40 are coming out in numbers that they came out for Obama, numbers that they came out, then that, that's how you lose Florida by three points. Yep. Remember, Biden only lost Florida by three points. This is, you know, we're, we're so, we saw what happened in 22 and we're all like, oh my God, right? It's probably, Florida's probably more like a five point state generically could turn out, make it two or three. The problem is what it would take to win the state, the Democrats haven't done. That's They've yet you know, to register voters right. for the last 300 years in the state of Florida, but at least the last three. They, Florida is a four-year project. Right. All the time. They, you cannot just Texas turn it is like the same a light way. switch. Don't even get yeah. me started on Texas. We'll you and I could do this. We'll like, do that in our second hour. Yes. But we got to leave it there. Chuck Todd, right. thank you for sharing you your analysis ready. with us on this. And joining us now from where else, the big board, is NBC News national political correspondent Steve Kornacki. And so, Steve, from Florida to Wisconsin now, one of our premier battleground states. They had their primary there last night. What do we know this morning about Wisconsin as we head into November that perhaps we didn't know yesterday? 
Uh, yeah, well, I think we know what we knew yesterday largely, which is Fair. it's going to be a, a battleground that could be decisive in this election. And obviously the margins, the last two elections, and it's not just the last two elections. Outside of the Obama years, the margins in Wisconsin have been close for a long time here. So you could see Biden winning it by six-tenths of a percent here, a margin of 20,000 in 2020. And I think the places to look on this map, we'll be talking a lot about them between now and Election Day and certainly on Election Night. You look in the suburbs here of Milwaukee. Milwaukee, particularly Waukesha County, Ozaki County. These are still big Republican suburbs, but they've become a lot less Republican mm -hmm. since Donald Trump came along. And even between 16 and 20, this is a big reason Trump won this state in 16, lost in 20. He didn't get as much out of Ozaki and Waukesha counties in 2020 as he did in 16. Trump also in 2016 had big surges in counties that have mid-sized small cities in them, places like Brown County, uh, where Green Bay is, you know, places Places like La Crosse County, where La Crosse is. And the problem Trump had again in 2020 was he still won Brown County here, but he didn't win it by as much as he did in 16. So he's got to improve. He's got to stop the losses in places like the suburbs, stop the losses in places like Green Bay. And he's actually got to claw back there some that he gave up in 2020 because the other problem Trump has is this one right here. Madison, state yeah. capital, University of Wisconsin. It's growing in population. It's getting more and more Democratic. And I think Democrats can squeeze even more out of here. So we'll be talking certainly a lot about those dynamics. It's going to be fascinating to watch. And Steve, we mentioned at the top a push by Trump and some Republicans to change the electoral uh, vote distribution in Nebraska, the critical battleground state of Nebraska. Can you walk us through why that would be such a big deal this November? Yeah, I mean, I'll take you through a scenario here, and I think you could see how this one electoral vote could actually be huge in this election. So this is where things ended in 2020, 306, 232 mm -hmm. Biden. First thing to remember, we had a census since then. Some, state, some states got more electoral votes, some got less. So if you ran the election all over again and you got the exact same result in terms of the states, it would now be 303, 235. Okay. Just on population shift, Trump gains three electoral votes. Now, we've been saying mathematically, what is Trump's most efficient way to get from there to 270? We'll just start working in order here of the states in terms of how close they were in 20. This was the closest one he lost, Arizona, about 10,000 votes. Sake of argument, what happens if Trump wins Arizona? There you go, he'd move to 246. Second closest, Georgia, just under 12,000 votes in 2020. If Trump were to get Georgia, now he's up to 262, mm -hmm. and this is where Nebraska comes in. Because right now, with Arizona and Georgia, Trump would need one of the big, big 10 states that he lost, Wisconsin, Michigan, or Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. But what happens if Nebraska changes this rule? Then another state comes into play, and it's one that Republicans are very bullish on. It's Nevada. Nevada yes. was blue in 16 and 20, but the margin's only about two points. And demographically, Republicans think this is a state where they got a future. So look what happens if Trump gets Nevada. 268 right now, but if Nebraska changes the rules, that uh, congressional district. Don't do it, Trump Steve. Won, there it is. Don't do it. 269, 269, and that, that's a reminder, if it is a tie, the House breaks the tie, and it's not every member who votes, it's every state that's delegation, right. and the Republicans are expected to control more delegations than Democrats, so the expectation is if it ever landed this way, it's advantage Trump. Steve Kornacki, haunting our nightmares for months to come with the 269, 269 ties. Steve, thank you for breaking it all down for us. You got it. And coming up in the aftermath of that fatal IDF airstrike on a humanitarian aid convoy, the message from the White House and from World Central Kitchen founder Jose Andres is that Israel must do better. How Israel's top officials are responding next. Plus, new domestic fallout from the war against Hamas. We'll take you inside President Biden's tense meeting with the Muslim community leaders and what it could mean for Biden's campaign hopes in November. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We just learned that President Biden is expected to speak with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu tomorrow. It will be their first conversation since seven aid workers with World Central Kitchen were killed by an Israeli airstrike in Gaza. And it comes as Netanyahu is facing increasing domestic pressure. Last night, demonstrators clashed with poli police outside the Prime Minister's residence in what has become the most significant anti-government protest since the war began in October. And today, Benny Gantz, a member of the war cabinet and political rival to Netanyahu, called for early elections to be held in September to, quote, prevent a rift in the nation. 
In an op-ed today, Chef Jose Andres, founder of World Central Kitchen, describes the seven aid workers who were killed in that Israeli strike as the best of humanity, who risked everything to get food to the people who need it. He also wrote, quote, Israel is better than the way this war is being waged. It's better than blocking food and medicine to civilians. It is better than killing aid workers who had coordinated their movements with the Israel Defense Forces. All this comes after President Biden also condemned the strike, saying that Israel was not doing enough to protect aid workers or civilians. NBC News international correspondent Raf Sanchez has more from Tel Aviv. The bodies of those slain seven World Central Kitchen aid workers have now crossed out of Gaza into Egypt as part of their long journey home for burial. They go with tributes from around the world, including from President Biden, who calls them fearless and brave, and leveled some of the most serious criticism at Israel that we have seen from the president yet. He said simply, Israel is not doing enough to protect either civilians or aid workers, and that this is part of the reason that it has been so difficult to get aid distributed inside of the Gaza Strip is that it is simply not safe for humanitarians. The U.N. says the killing of these seven aid workers, not an isolated incident. Around 200 humanitarians have been killed in Gaza since the start of the war, the vast majority of them Palestinians. Among the seven World Central Kitchen staff who were identified overnight, 33-year-old Jacob Flickinger, he is a, was a dual U.S.-Canadian citizen who was part of the relief operation at World Central Kitchen. Now, the Israeli military making public the initial findings of its probe into this deadly series of airstrikes. They say this was a misidentification of those three World Central Kitchen vehicles. They say it happened at night in a complex wartime environment and that this is a tragic mistake which they deeply regret. But the Israeli military is facing a number of questions. World Central Kitchen says that its vehicles were clearly identified with its symbol and that it coordinated with the Israeli military about their movements ahead of time. The charity also telling NBC News that two days before the deadly airstrike, they believe an Israeli sniper shot at one of those vehicles. They say the bullet damaged a wing mirror. Nobody was hurt, but that they filed a complaint with the Israeli military. We asked the IDF about this shooting incident. They did not come back to us. This is having a major impact on the humanitarian mission inside of Gaza. World Central Kitchen has paused its own aid operations. We saw those three ships heading from Cyprus to Gaza, turning around and heading back. A number of other aid organizations also putting their operations inside of Gaza on pause. So this is a major blow to the humanitarian effort at a time when it is needed the most. Back to you. All right, that was Raf Sanchez reporting. I want to bring in now Kelly O'Donnell. She's outside the White House. So, Kelly, as we mentioned, President Biden has leveled some of his harshest criticisms now at Israel, this statement following the strike on the World Central Kitchen workers. But is there any sign that it won't just be his rhetoric shifting, that perhaps the administration's policy towards Israel might follow? Well, so far, when we've been pressing top officials about this, the answer we're getting back is that there is not a change in policy, that the U.S. still believes that it will have a partner in Israel and will defend Israel and will provide military weapons for sale to Israel, and that that is ongoing. However, what is certainly notable is that the president's tone has changed dramatically and that he has certainly put pressure on Israel to do something different here and to recognize the scope and scale of the reaction and the horror of famine in Gaza, civilians uh, dying at a very high rate and suffering, and now these prominent aid workers among many who have been killed. We're talking about the Jose Andres group, the World Central Kitchen. There have been many more aid workers from various organizations that have also died in this conflict. So the message from the White House is that Israel is not doing enough and that we expect will be delivered in the direct conversation between the president and Prime Minister Netanyahu. Their relationship has long been tense, but it is also a deep and long-lasting relationship. They've known each other some 40 years. 
And so this will be an opportunity for the president, if he is going to change policy, to do it voice to voice over the phone. Yeah, they've made clear, both of them, that they have a pretty candid speaking relationship. And Kelly, the president also had these scaled back Ramadan events overnight. Some Muslim leaders rejected the invitation to even come. Take us inside the room. What do we know about what happened? Very different from a couple of years ago when this holiday was celebrated at the White House in the East Room with a big public event. Officials say that what was requested from Muslim leaders in the community was a working group meeting, and then they did have time to break the fast. But small scale, very quiet, and very different than what we might have otherwise expected. At the same time, some of those who are directly involved in this wanted that face-to-face -face meeting, we are told, in order to confront the administration, to talk candidly, uh, not a time for celebration when their uh, fellow Muslims are suffering in Gaza. And so this is a very different tone. Now, the White House says that they wanted to respect that request to have a working meeting. They understood that there would be uh, candid words and difficult circumstances. They also say that they are having these meetings on an ongoing basis below the president's level. And with this, they wanted the president to be involved in these conversations directly. So different than what we've seen in the past, but also this moment is quite different as well. Yes, it is. Kelly O'Donnell, thank you. And joining me now is retired Admiral James Stavridis, former NATO Supreme Allied Commander and now NBC News Chief International Analyst. So, Admiral, as a former commander, what's your reaction to this strike on these World Central Kitchen workers? The convoy was clearly marked. They coordinated with the IDF. How did this go so wrong? Uh, clearly, the Israelis felt they had a senior Hamas operative. We've watched them use this kind of technique uh, drones, missiles, uh, taking out convoys. Uh, in this case, just deeply flawed intelligence, heartbreaking, tragic. Um, the Israelis will pull this apart. I'm quite confident uh, they will fully admit to their mistakes. Uh, certainly the United States has had instances of this kind of event, always tragic. And uh, my heart goes out to those workers who are real heroes in every dimension. How important is it for Israel to take really serious responsibility for this? I, I think there's a lot of talk that this could be a turning point in the war, or at least how the rest of the world looks at Israel's handling of the war. Uh, Israel has already lost the international narrative. Clearly, the vast majority of countries uh, believe Israel has gone way, way too far, is violating the laws of war. Um, and this incident will add fuel to that fire. Israel needs to tactically stand up, take full responsibility, show what happened, discipline those involved. That's very important. Mm -hmm. And then strategically, at the same time, Israel needs to pull back the lens, get the aid flowing into Gaza, loosen the constraints on these aid convoys. I think it is going to be a turning point in the way Israel approaches the war, and it must be. Do you think it's a turning point in the debate about conditioning U.S. aid to Israel? The Biden administration has continued to provide military assistance. At some point, the U.S. surely becomes or at least looks culpable to the rest of the world for this kind of thing, no? Absolutely right. And the way the administration has been looking at it, I think correctly, is that it's not an on and off switch right. of 100% aid or 0%. It's, it's a rheostat. They're dialing up the pressure on the Israelis. You see that in a number of different dimensions. The next click on that rheostat is going to be stopping uh, providing offensive weapons to the Israelis. I got to think that's being communicated uh, off stage, sotto voce, to the Israelis. Um, we do that as friends of the Israelis mm -hmm. in the sense that it will push them toward the behavior that will help them in the long term. And I want to ask you about the strike that would on any other day be the top news in the war, this strike on the Iranian consulate in Syria. Israel has had no comment on the strike, but somebody did it. So is a strike on a consulate, is that a legitimate target? Does that violate international law? What are we dealing with here? Um, in the sense that Israel and Iran have no diplomatic relations and are already 
engage in a shadow war, I would argue it is, in fact, a legitimate target for the Israeli Defense Forces. You'll get some international lawyers who would disagree with me on that and say, nope, it's a diplomatic compound. But I think from an Israeli perspective, uh, when they listen to the leadership of Iran talk about wiping Israel off the face of the earth, mm -hmm. about the Houthi attacks on Israeli shipping, about Hezbollah launching missiles day after day, and Hamas, above all, a creature of Iran, uh, raping, torturing, mutilating Israeli citizens. I think it's a legitimate target. Now, Iran has vowed to retaliate for this, but I feel like we've heard that from them before. What will their response or lack thereof tell us about their appetite to escalate this into a broader war in the region? Iran has no appetite to turn this into a broad war with Israel because they know if they did that, the United States ultimately would end up with Israel, and that would lead to extremely destructive effect on the Iranian armed forces. So what I suspect Iran will do is launch some additional weapons from Hezbollah. They might undertake a, a kind of a assassination attempt against senior Israeli officials. Look, Israel will take care of itself. I don't see Iran taking on a big, massive campaign, because they know at the end of the day, they'd be on the losing end of that conflict. All right, Admiral James Savridis, thank you for your time and for your expertise today. You bet. Thank you, Garrett. And turning now to that devastating earthquake today in Taiwan. At least nine people are dead and close to a thousand injured after a powerful 7.4 magnitude quake struck the east coast of the island this morning. As you can see here, buildings shook, some collapsed, just as people were headed to work and to school. It was the strongest quake to hit the country in 25 years. Right now, rescuers are working to free over 140 people who are still trapped. More than 100 buildings have been damaged. Strong aftershocks followed the initial earthquakes, including a 6.5 magnitude tremor. The Biden administration says it is monitoring the events and is prepared to offer any assistance Taiwan may need. Up next, as former President Trump ramps up his rhetoric on the border, a controversial Texas border law allowing local police to arrest and detain illegal migrants is back in court today. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. The Biden administration is once again facing off against the state of Texas over a controversial immigration law, in this case the one dubbed SB4, that would allow state law enforcement officials to arrest, detain, and deport individuals suspected of crossing the border illegally. Today, a three-judge panel heard oral arguments on whether that law is constitutional or if it conflicts with existing federal immigration policy. Right now, the law has been temporarily blocked from going into effect as it makes its way through the appeals process. But regardless of how the appeals court rules, it's yet another contentious case that appears headed to the Supreme Court. Joining me now is NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley. So, Julia, you followed these arguments today. What stood out to you and what do we think happens next? Well, I'd say what stood out to me, Garrett, is the fact that Texas kind of did an about face on what this law means in the first place. Oh, good. Yeah, so that, <laughs> that's where we started yeah. this morning. And the lawyer arguing for the state of Texas said, look, maybe Texas went too far. Those were the words we heard. And he said that, in fact, what could happen if Mexico refuses to take back migrants deported by Texas, as Mexico has said it will, Will refuse to do so, that these migrants would instead just be handed over to CBP, Customs and Border Protection, mm -hmm. at a port of entry. That's where migrants end up when they cross the border today, Garrett. So it really circumvents the whole purpose of why Texas would do this in the first place. They would have them arrested and sentenced for trespassing. That's something they're already doing now. Mm -hmm. Perhaps Texas judges could get involved and local law enforcement would feel empowered to start arresting people in the interior of the state. That could be a change. But it's really not the SB4 that was signed into law. It's not the SB4 that they've described and what they've put into briefs to this court or the Supreme Court, and it was a real surprise here. And in fact, the three-judge panel started asking the folks from the federal government arguing for the Justice Department, is this something you could agree to? It just got into this really weird hypothetical territory. Yeah, that is very strange. <laughs> so I want to ask you also about the former president. He's been ramping up his rhetoric still farther on the border. He's talking about the idea of a border bloodbath. Give us the reality check here about the, the violent crime, real-life statistics both at the border and, and from migrants. 
Well, I actually was just speaking to some folks yesterday who have been looking at the most recent numbers from the state of Texas, because that's the only state that actually records immigration status of people that they arrest. And for people arrested for and charged with homicide, they are more likely to be U.S. citizens. In other words, illegal immigrants commit crimes overall on a lower rate per capita than U.S. citizens mm -hmm. do. And as far as the numbers at the border right now, we're not talking about record highs. We saw that last year. This year, they've been around five to 6,000 illegal crossings per day. Certainly not exactly where they want to be, but it's not the dire five alarm fire that we saw last year. The other part of this that's interesting is the former president has been saying that Mexico will negotiate with him better. He will negotiate with Mexico somehow more effectively than President Biden has on this issue. What do we know about the state of that relationship and what are Mexican officials saying about all of the border uh, drama that we're experiencing on the northern side of it right now? Well, Mexican officials tell me that it is a policy of this administration and likely the next one to be as cooperative as possible with the United States. They don't mess around with their largest trading partner. Mm -hmm. uh, Mexico is also our largest trading partner. That's a relationship that needs to stay. But the Trump camp really wants to ramp up pressure on Mexico to take back more migrants, to interdict more migrants on their way to the United States. And they could do that in some pretty harsh ways, including tariffs. It's a question of, is Trump willing to play with the economy and global trade on that scale? So that's certainly something I'm watching for and something you might be watching for, too, as you listen to Trump's rhetoric. Definitely. And there's a presidential election in Mexico this year. So all of these balls Very are Very soon. Here. Yeah. That's right. All right, Julia Ainsley, thank you for that reporting. And after the break, poll problems and battleground bids. I'll talk to a Democratic lawmaker from Michigan as President Biden battles political headwinds in a state that is a must win for his campaign in November. Congresswoman Haley Stevens joins me next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. This is a very important state. You win Michigan, you win the election. Welcome back. That was Donald Trump yesterday in Michigan making a statement that many people in both campaigns probably agree with. A state where he leads President Biden, according to the new Wall Street Journal poll of battleground states, although that lead is within the margin of error. Biden's allies worry that President Biden's support for Israel and its war with Hamas could be hurting his chances in the state, considering its sizable Arab-American population. I'm joined now by Congresswoman Haley Stevens, a Democrat from Michigan and a surrogate for the Biden-Harris campaign. Congresswoman, thank you for being here. So let's go big picture. How does President Biden put the winning coalition back together and win in Michigan again? Well, that's what the Biden campaign is working on every single day with the commitment to open 30 offices by the end of this month. Uh, last month, we opened an office in Oakland County to, to great fanfare. They're working on that coalition building. They're running a fun, inclusive, uh, compassionate oriented campaign that is firing people up. And most importantly, they're not taking anything for granted. Joe Biden is a consistent, steady, successful, leader who has delivered on his promises time and time again, and he has a continued vision for this country. He wants to continue to tackle gun violence. He wants to continue to deliver for our clean energy economy. And most importantly for voters in Michigan, he wants to stand up for women's rights. He wants to codify Roe. We can trust Joe Biden to do that. We certainly cannot go back to Donald Trump and his plan to implement a six-week abortion ban and, and take this country backwards. It's not going to work. It didn't work in 2020, and it's certainly not going to work in 2024. What message do you think the president received from the more than 100,000 Michiganders who voted uncommitted in the primary last month, and what does he intend to do to win those folks back? Well, certainly the president understands that people have a right to exercise their opinion and their voice. And you can't have a better leader than Joe Biden in this moment because he's a listener and he's a leader at the same time. And so he's meeting people with the compassion and the dedication that they deserve on a very complicated and tough issue. There's no doubt a, a tremendous amount of pain in both our Arab and Jewish community since October 7th. Everybody wants to see war end and war not go on. Uh, it, it's harrowing to watch the images and see this go on day to day. And I believe that Joe Biden has a plan. Uh, and he spoke about that very clearly in the State of the Union, about his dedication to providing humanitarian support and also continuing to stand by our, our longstanding ally, which is, which is Israel. And Joe Biden's record is very clear on that front. 
Donald well, Trump, he does jumps it need all to be, over the page. I, I don't dispute that last point, but I will ask, I mean, is, is listening enough? I mean, these Arab American voters are really angry in a lot of cases. I mean, the idea that the president has listened compassionately does not seem to be enough to win over somebody who's going to go out in the cold and, and write down uncommitted as a message to him specifically that this isn't working. That's a great follow up question. And look, it's responsible listening and it's also action oriented listening. It, it's not just paying lip service. Uh, it is hearing directly uh, from voters and from constituencies. And, and look, the, the foreign policy approach that the Biden administration has uh, been taking, and, and certainly we've heard this from Jake Sullivan, it has been transparent. Uh, it has been consistent. And, and also, it has been very communicative. So what we're not going to see is Joe Biden take a 180 uh, degree uh, turn in, in another direction. But what he is doing is doubling down on the commitment to humanitarian support and to aid. He is trying to work with Congress on the right package. I don't think that you're going to see this president sign something that doesn't include that humanitarian aid, which in a lot of my conversations with stakeholders and folks on the ground, that is absolutely essential here, right? We have a failed state in Hamas and, the, uh, and their leadership that has truly endangered and hurt people in Gaza. We all know that needs to go. We need to rebuild. You see the Biden administration putting forward a plan to rebuild and again, not taking anything for granted. And this is this is one issue that, that has large ramifications in the state of Michigan. But look at how Joe Biden has delivered for our manufacturing economy. We had six automotive plants shutter under Donald Trump, one here in Michigan. And yet we've had 350,000 manufacturing jobs in just my state alone get created under Joe Biden. I got manufacturing crawling crawling out the, the uh, you know all over our, our state here in Oakland County to mid Michigan from solar to battery to obviously automotive a record automotive contract uh cut and something that Joe Biden endorsed and supported along the way standing by our UAW workers. Don't take that stuff for granted because you you see how Joe Biden is communicating and leading at the same time. I'm hearing you say that this state even will be decided by many more issues than just this war. You mentioned the UAW workers. I'm curious about that endorsement that the president got from the UAW. Has he done enough to communicate uh, both the value of that endorsement and the idea that he is specifically pro-worker, not just sort of pro-union conceptually, to the degree you see a difference between those things? Well, it, it was certainly a ringing moment to see UAW President Sean Fain at the State of the Union. I was certainly very proud uh, to, to see that. And what is going to take place over these next six to seven months with the, with the Biden campaign is work in the union halls. It's not just big rallies. You saw the president uh, come into Michigan, come to Region 1 here, uh, UAW Region 1 uh, over in Macomb County, not holding a big rally, but engaging with workers, learning their stories, winning over their votes. It's those nooks and crannies that are so deeply important. Yes, people love to go to a political rally. You see participation on that front, but they also want to know who they're voting for. They want to connect with uh, their, their president and they want to hear their vis his, his vision. And so I believe that this campaign is doing this. And, and, and frankly, I'm a part of it. And we're, we're getting into the weeds here. And that's going to pay dividends in the neighborhoods, the precinct work, the, 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 the voter operation work that's going to be so critical to November. Just wait and see, because I got to bet that my district's turning out the most number of Democratic votes of any congressional district in, in, in the state. I got a little competition going All on right. with my colleague, Debbie Dingell. So. <laughs> we will mark this tape for that moment and check it in, in six or seven months now. Congresswoman Haley Stevens, thank, thank you. you for coming on. Good to see you. And still to come, Trump on the spot. How the former president and now Florida resident is responding after his home state paved the way for a six-week ban on abortion. With the issue now set to appear on the November ballot. The panel's next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. Turning back now to the campaign trail where the state of Florida has put former President Trump into something of a box on the issue of abortion after its Supreme Court paved the way for a strict six-week ban on the procedure to take effect. 
while also putting the issue on the ballot this November. That means Florida voters will get to vote on potentially overturning that ban and codifying abortion protections up until viability while they also cast their vote for president. It's something of a dream scenario for some Democrats in their rivals' backyard. A reporter yesterday asked Florida resident Donald Trump how he would vote on that abortion ballot initiative. Here's what he had to say. What I'm going to do is make a statement on it next week. I'm going to have a formal statement. I'm going to make it on next week. And that's an issue that we should win. The Roe v. Wade issue is an issue that we should win. It was sent back to the states. The states are going to really dominate, and I think that's what you're seeing. But I'm going to make a statement on that next week, and it'll be a very concise statement. And what should we prepare for? Could that be a change in position? No, not a change in position. It's going to be something that is very important. You have to go with your heart. You have to go with your spirit. And it's going to be something that I don't think people would be overly surprised. But we also have to remember we have to win elections. It's very important. You have to win elections. Otherwise, you go back to where you were. There were a lot of words spoken there, but none of them was an immediate answer on where Mr. Trump stands on the Florida abortion initiative beyond him basically saying, as he so often does, to stay tuned. Joining me now on set is Molly Ball, senior political correspondent for The Wall Street Journal, Mo Alethi, Democratic strategist and executive director of the Georgetown University Institute of Politics and Public Service, and Brendan Buck, former advisor to Republican House Speakers Paul Ryan and John Boehner. He's also an NBC News political analyst and the only person taller than me allowed to participate in this panel. <laughs> um, Molly, we'll start on the abortion issue here. Donald Trump has been on every side of this issue over his political career. Does it behoove him to take one specific position? if not now, ever? <laughs> Probably not. I mean, and what you heard him say there uh, was, was, was very suggestive, uh, and I'll be eager to hear if he does, in fact, take a, a concise and firm position, as he says he's going to do next week. But uh, he seems to be hinting uh, that, you know, he's saying we have to win elections, which signals to me that he's not going to give the pro-lifers all they want. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's saying that the states are going to dominate, which suggests to me that he's not going to come out in favor of some sort of a national ban, uh, which is what a lot of the pro-life movement wants, you know, advocating for Congress to pass some sort of limit, whether it's, you know, 15 or 16 weeks, as he's hinted in the past, uh, or something more or less restrictive. So that those are the tea leaves that I read in his statement. But as you say, he tends to do this thing where he takes all sides of an issue and mm -hmm. lets everybody hear what they want to. Uh, and, and, and so I wouldn't put it past him to just keep doing that. But, Brenda, we talk about this kind of box that the state of Florida put him in. I think that reporter asked the right question. Donald Trump, the voter, yeah. if you could say we're going to give it to the states. But at some point, Donald Trump, the voter, has to say six weeks or 24 weeks. When he casts his ballot, presumably he has to answer that question at some point uh, if he keeps getting asked it. I, I recognize that's a big presumption yeah. here. But what, you know... Talk to me through the sort of implications of where he lands if it's a binary choice between those two options. Yeah, what he also saw there was the tactic that we're familiar with Donald Trump, which is saying, I'm going to release a plan later. Two weeks. Remember, usually it's, it's two weeks. It's usually two weeks out. Right. Now it's one week. So we'll be, I'll be surprised if he actually lets himself get pinned down on it. I think he realizes there's no good answer for you for all the mm -hmm. reasons that Molly laid out. The Florida issue has put it back in front of him. But one thing we do know is he's worried about this. He's thinking about this. We, we've seen reported that he's talking about a 16th week. He, he knows that he needs to find some safe ground. Problem is, I don't think any Republican has found really safe ground for a general election on this. And as Molly pointed out, there are so many constituencies that have been asking for something for so long. But what, we, what we've actually seen in a lot of polling and, and actually in voting in places, there are a lot of Republican voters who don't agree with the sort of uh, longstanding Republican position on this. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know where he's going to land, but I'm sure it will disappoint a lot of people. Mo, isn't the risk of sort of just saying you kick it to the state that then you own every state's policy, whether it's a six-week ban or no ban at all, you are basically responsible for all of that. And the Biden campaign's not waiting here, right? They have tried to nail Donald Trump on his boasting about ending Roe. Talk to me about about the ways that Democrats can best take advantage of the hemming and hawing here from the former president. Yeah, I mean, I, like many people, laughed when he said, I'll give you an answer next week. Right. But, you know, I, I suspect that if I'm the Biden campaign, I don't need that because Donald Trump said everything he needs to say already. Right. When he went out there and took credit for the overturning of Roe v. Wade, when he says, I did that. I overturned Roe v. Wade by pointing all these justices. That's what matters to the Biden campaign. They have that ad. They are running that. They are going to continue to run against him as the guy that, that was responsible for putting states like Florida in this position. Mm -hmm. Because you're exactly right. 
now, it doesn't matter what Donald Trump says. What each state does is now going to be the next battle in this war over abortion rights and reproductive freedom. And it's a war politically that Democrats are eager to keep fighting. He is also a master at muddying the waters, though. And I think that's clearly Correct. what he's trying to do here. And he could potentially use these state. I mean, I've, I've been talking about this for a long time. The Republican Party has no position. So every mm -hmm. state were at the whims of state lawmakers. And that's never a good place to be. But he could use it to his advantage and say, I think Florida was too extreme. I think Oklahoma was too extreme. And try to look, make himself moderate. Of course, Democrats are going to say something different. Right. But it does give him an opportunity to muddle, muddle things a little but bit. But if he ever gets the debate he's so plaintively asking for, that could be thrown back in his face sure. effectively, too. Molly, if I consult my tactical political handbook here, it would tell me that the, po the party that is more united on an issue like this almost always wins the debate. When the party is completely splintered, as Brendan indicates Republicans are, it blows up in their faces. Do you think Democrats can stay united on a defend row platform, kind of let that mean whatever it means to voters, and run that through November as effectively as they have over the last year or so? Well, I would say, on the one hand, yes, I do think the Democrats stay united on this because as much as, uh, you know, the, there have been attempts to get them to answer more questions about things like late-term abortions, we haven't seen that resonate with voters. People just don't seem uh, to care about that end of things. Uh, but, you know, I also think it's important to, to remember that we don't know how this interacts with a presidential election. Mm -hmm. This is the first presidential election since the fall of Roe. And what we have seen in elections that were candidate elections, that were not ballot initiatives specifically on abortion, is that this issue is actually very unpredictable. You know, I was in Florida in, uh, in advance of the 2022 midterms and went to a event where Ron DeSantis's opponent, Charlie Crist, was surrounded by abortion rights activists holding signs and saying, you can't reelect Ron DeSantis. He's going to, he's already limited abortion and he's going to mm -hmm. do it more. Voters were not persuaded by Correct. that, even if they were on that side of the issue. When it came to a candidate, they were looking at it more holistically. So you can't just look at this as simplistically as saying Democrats are right. on the right side of this important issue, therefore they win the election. Right. A ballot measure, especially alone, is not a silver bullet. I want to change gears a little bit, Mode. Talk about a change in thinking that appears to be existing among Democrats when it comes to Donald Trump. Not any of you, many of our viewers don't get to listen to quite as many of his rallies as I do. So I want to play you some of a, something of a supercut of what he had to say last night on the campaign trail in Wisconsin. Let's listen. Listen. I'm not the threat to democracy. Joe Biden and the fascists that control him, and they do control him, are the real threat to democracy. The radical left Democrats rigged the presidential election in 2020, and we're not going to allow them to rig the presidential election in 2024. 2024 is our final battle. With you at my side, we will demolish the deep state. We will expel the warmongers. We will drive out the globalists. We will cast out the communists, Marxists, and fascists. We will throw off the sick political class that hates our country. They absolutely hate our country. We will rout the fake news media. We will drain the swamp, and we will liberate our country from these tyrants and villains. I mean, there's some pretty wild, fantastical, outlandish stuff there. And what I have noticed recently from Democrats is a desire to make sure that people see that. As a Democratic strategist, where do you land on the idea of more Trump, not less, is better for electing Democrats and specifically Joe Biden? Look, I think Donald Trump is one of the best salespeople for Joe Biden. Having said that, having said that, that's, that is only part of the equation, right? I want Donald Trump out there as much as possible because I think when people hear that, it, it reminds them of sort of all the cringe that was the lead up to the 2020 mm -hmm. election, right? It just reminds them of that icky feeling that we all had heading into that election. But Democrats have to offer more. They can't just make this a referendum on Trump, though they could. What they need to do is continue, and Joe Biden needs to continue to tell people, here is what the alternative looks like. He needs to say, here's what I am going to do while he's talking about all this crazy stuff, looking backwards, while he's talking, still talking about the 2020 election and overturning and all these conspiracy theories, here's what I'm going to do to make your life a little bit easier. That cannot in this election, especially given where both candidates are in terms of approval ratings, they cannot just rest on Donald Trump's unpopularity, remind people of it, 
but offer the alternative. Do you agree with the relative risk of that, especially if Trump, I mean, this is April, Trump's going to get further off the deep end by November? I think there is risk in letting him set the tone of the campaign. And that's yeah. what he is a master at, is we're going to talk about what I want to talk about. And if we let Donald Trump just talk about only immigration or, or, or any of that stuff, that is to his advantage, no, no matter what the context is. If one person gets to define the issues that we're talking about, they win. Certainly, the, the Biden camp needs to engage in there as well. I, 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 don't, I don't know if, if, if we're turning attention back to, Donald, to Joe Biden's policy platforms are necessarily the answer, but I think Joe Biden needs to engage in pointing out exactly the danger behind some of those things and attack a little more on those things. That's an excellent point and one we're going to have to end on, Mo, Brendan, Molly. Thank you all for coming in and thank you all for watching. We're back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. The news continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.